pleasure to be here. And I'd like to thank uh, Shockway for um, having me here and, and presenting on, on behalf of everyone involved with the reducer. Those are my uh, conflicts. Um, so uh, this goes back a long time. This, uh, first of all, it was, uh, the concept was introduced uh, in, the, in the 50s by, by Dr. Beck, who did uh, open heart surgery. That was a time when cabbage was uh, non-existent. And so what he did was he put a, a suture on the coronary sinus. And it turned out that these patients at that time, uh, they improved in terms of in angina they had a reduced mortality and also a reduced infarct size. But then, of course, uh, kind of forgotten because of uh, the uh, coronary artery bypass surgery that uh, came along. And so this procedure was no longer performed. But um, a similar um, procedure was uh, performed, uh, and it's called uh, PIXO. So that was an intermittent uh, balloon occlusion of the coronary sinus, uh, which was introduced in uh, Vienna, Austria. And it was shown that it was, was able to uh, protect the myocardial uh, tissue and also reduce infarct size and improve coronary microvascular function. And it was until uh, the early 2000s when Neovasc uh, developed the uh, coronary sinus reducer, which is an hourglass-shaped device. It's a uh, stainless steel mesh. And the first study was, uh, was performed, uh, first patients, I believe, were done in India and then also in Germany, and it was shown that it was able to improve angina, improve ischemia, and improve coronary microvascular function. So my, talks, my task here is to talk uh, a little bit about the coronary sinus, about the design, about how the procedure is performed, and uh, touch upon a little bit about the mechanism as to why the reducer uh, is uh, functioning. So the, as I mentioned, it's an hourglass uh, device that is uh, basically it's a, it's a stainless steel mesh that is mounted on an hourglass balloon with a proximal section maximum up to 13 millimeters and distal 11 millimeters, and it has a neck uh, of an, and a diameter of 3 millimeters with a length of uh, 22 millimeters. Okay, so the, the, uh, the reducer is, is, is positioned, it's a juggler axis, it's a ninth French uh, axis through the, uh, through the juggler vein. And you first try to engage the coronary sinus, and I, I don't know how the situation is in the US, but in Europe at least, interventional lists are not very familiar with uh, uh, the coronary sinus, and that's something that we have to, have to uh, teach and to introduce. Of course, the AP doctors are familiar with it. Um, but we tried, it's, it's a new area, and so uh, we have to um, teach the, um, the physicians how to do this, the interventional lists, uh, when it comes to uh, implanting a reducer. So first you access the uh, uh, right atrium with a multipurpose catheter, and you try to engage the coronary sinus with a uh, 0.035 wire. Um, you in advance the, uh, the guiding um, and the reducer uh, on the delivery system, and then you uh, position it in the most proximal part of the coronary sinus. And then you withdraw the sheath and you inflate the, uh, the device with, uh, with the balloon. So typically you have a 10 to 20% oversizing of the implanted reducer. And then uh, you have to tell the patients that that is very critical. And we know that these patients are desperate and they're very much you know, looking forward to have some improvement in symptoms. But you have to mention that, the, that it may take uh, four to eight weeks before uh, initial symptoms start to uh, uh, improve. So people ask all the time, what is the mechanism? We, we know that there is an improvement in symptoms. Pe uh, people uh, do better uh, once they have uh, received a reducer. And what is the mechanism? And it was actually early on uh, introduced uh, um, in 2000, uh, published 2001 by IDO, where they did a... Um, a study to where they were able that the uh, coronary sinus occlusion was enhancing the coronary, coronary collateral flow and reduce in, in the cardiac ischemia. So they ligated the uh, LAO, and when they uh, put a coronary sinus occluder, they actually were able to show that there is an improvement in, in blood flow. And that was uh, early on, uh, before any reducer was actually implanted into, uh, into humans. Uh, this was extensively studied um, by uh, Shmuel Banai, who did, who was obviously the one who started the whole um, reducer story. 
And this is uh, the results that were published. Uh, it's a preclinical safety study and feasibility study. They did a lot of mini swine, but they also did, uh, they looked at safety, but they also looked at uh, efficacy and a DSE, and they were able to show that there was an improvement and a recovery of perfusion in these swines. And they also were able to measure the pressure gradient across the uh, reducer. The histology was also favorable with tissue response and improvement is in ischemia and, ischemia and no mortality of the, uh, of the swine. And then very recently, this year, and we talked about ANOCA, but this study done by Tommaso Gori in, in uh, Germany actually uh, showed that in these patients, there was an, in, so patients with microvascular angina uh, with an IMR ab above 25, and it was not using a reducer, but it was a concept of the reducer by putting an undersized balloon in the coronary sinus and then deflating the balloon in the right atrium as a sham control and then looking at measurements that were performed at rest and during maximal coronary hyperemia. And these patients were blinded uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the randomization. What they were able to show is that there was uh, a reduction in, in the resting uh, resistance in patients who had a balloon versus uh, the sham control. And so the microvascular resistance index also improved the IMR and the balloon group was lower than the, uh, the ones in the sham group. So this, is, this gives you a sort of an idea that indeed it is all related to the blood flow and the um, improvement in perfusion. And that's exactly also what Ido had shown in the DOC model is that you have an, uh, a flow reversal. When you have ischemia, you have uh, less flow to the subendocardial tissue. And when you put the reducer in term, when, when there's also the presence of ischemia, you actually are able to reduce the, uh, the uh, to invert the flow, and so you have a epi to endo improvement of the flow in presence of the reducer. And that was also illustrated in this uh, study in Italy, where they evaluated 21 refractory angina patients with obstructive coronary artery disease, and who underwent physiological assessments before and at four months, and you can see that the IMR baseline uh, at 33, went down to 16 at four months with an improvement of uh, coronary flow reserve. And as uh, also mentioned by, uh, by Dr. Henry, um, PET scan is, is an incredible, um, valuable tool to assess the, uh, the mechanism and to improve the perfusion to show the benefits of the reducer and this was done uh, in patients with refractory angina before implantation and 12 weeks after implantation where you have a better uh, perfusion uh, using PET. And also again illustrated in a study by uh, Renil da Silva in the context of apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this is a very important tool to actually show that the device is doing something to the patient. And I just want to end here with two important um, uh, notes, is that the NeoVasc reducer, the shockwave reducer, was granted the breakthrough device designation from the FDA in 2018, and it was uh, also implemented in the 2019 ESC guidelines um, that a reducer device for coronary sinus constriction may be considered to ameliorate symptoms um, of debilitating angina refractory to optimal medical and revascularization strategy. So with that, thank you for your attention.